Hi guys and welcome back to the Bike Cave. Today we're going to take a step closer to the final build of my new mountain bike. However, we've got some issues to resolve first. Today we're going to have some fun messing around with the suspension forks and the brakes of the pivot point. This is a bike I got last November and I'm planning to build a really versatile bike that will be able to handle mountain bike trails and also be usable for some of the tricks I like to do. If you already are a subscriber to the channel, you may have watched the past video in which I rebuilt its wheels and you saw that I already had this on my old cross country bike. In a similar manner, the brakes I'm going to use for this bike build were the brakes I had on my first 3 trials bike before I upgraded them for the Hoptec 3 trials on brakes I have today. On the other hand, the suspension which is the Rocksack sector is the one that this bike had when I got it and thus I think that it's almost brand new and it was not on any of my older bikes. However, both the suspension fork and my old brakes have to be checked and completely rebuilt if I want to reuse them on my new bike. So, I think that today it's time to discuss about an abbreviation that is very well known in my professional field and this is the RTFM, which means read the f***ing manual. Long story short, I've messed around with a couple of suspensions before for a professional project I had some years ago, but even after that I couldn't say that I could confidently handle the complete maintenance of a suspension without reading its specific manual first. Each suspension is different and some may need tricks that you have to keep in mind when messing around with them. I know that if you have messed around with many different suspensions, you already know the ABCs to handle almost everything, but I strongly believe that even then, a quick look into the specific manual of a suspension could potentially save you from mistakes down the line. So, for this one, I visited the Rockstar website and I found the specific manual of this suspension fork. Then I read it really quick and also I had the manual open during the maintenance procedure to verify that I do exactly what I need to do. Some very useful stuff that I could only find in the manual was the amount of oil that was required this time both for the air spring and the damper and of course the tightening torque for whichever case it was specified during the maintenance procedure. I'm pretty happy that the maintenance directions were specified very clearly in the manual and I had the suspension fork maintained in no time. I replaced all the o-rings at the seals of the suspension fork and also I filled it with fresh suspension oil. Now it feels as good as new and also taking everything apart showed me that indeed it was very slightly used before I get this bike. So I'm very happy about that and I cannot wait to ride it in the mountains when this bike build is finished. For the second part of this video I decided to rebuild my old SRAM DB5 brakes that came with my first retrialized bike. These brakes may not be good enough for bike trials, but I'm sure that they will be great for mountain biking. Also, it has to be mentioned that I didn't keep them on my street trials bike for a long time and so I never had the need to bleed them or generally maintain them. So, I now had to learn how to bleed them and to do so I decided to read the manual I found on the bleeding kit I got. I know that there are many videos out there showing and explaining the tricks to bleed any specific brake, but I always believe that the manual is a good starting point for everything. To be honest, I was impressed with the detailed and thorough explanation of the bleeding process that was described in this manual. It was so helpful and I followed these directions to a T with no problem understanding anything that was described there. However, after finishing the bleeding process, I was surprised that the lever was not responsive at all. So, now it was time to close the manual and act as an actual engineer to solve this problem. So, the first thing I did was to separate the lever from the caliper so as to test whether the problem was caused from the caliper pistons or the lever. After a bit of testing and a bit of tinkering with the first brake, I realized that the calipers were working just fine and that it was the levers that were sticky and unresponsive. So, I decided to take everything apart and I was surprised that I had to modify my secret pliers to manage to take the piston apart. Then I saw that the problem was caused by the piston which seemed to be quite sticky and I was thinking that this could be caused either by the seals or the piston itself. Having taken everything apart and after examining all the bits and pieces of the lever, I realized that the problem had been caused by the piston itself as the seals are still as good as new. So the problem seems to be that the piston material had been swollen by absorbing either oil or humidity over the years that it was not in use. This could also be verified by actually measuring the diameter of the piston where the major diameter of the piston comes close to the holes of the piston chamber. So, immediately I thought that I could modify the diameter of the spots and then I could order new pistons and have working brakes to finish my bike build until I get the new ones. So I got my drill and I used it as a lathe to symmetrically sand down a tenth of a millimeter and get my brakes to work properly again. After this one it was time to get everything back together and give these levers a try. 
Assembling everything back together was also quite tricky, but after a while everything was ready. I was so surprised that this one worked out so perfectly and now my livers feel as good as new. Actually, it has to be mentioned that after going online to search for replacement pistons, I saw that this is a well-known issue for these brakes and I was happy that I also found another video that does exactly the same thing to save the existing pistons and make the levers functional again. If you are curious about this one, I'll have the link to the relevant video in the description below. I'm pretty confident that this bike hack solved the issue and that these levers will work smoothly from now on. However, I always want to be prepared and so I decided to order a new pair of pistons, but with a twist. Understanding that even if I get a new set of polymer pistons, they will absorb oil or humidity again and they will get unresponsive in the future, I found some custom pistons that are made out of titanium and so, once they are fitted into the levers, their dimensions will be unchanged forever, although they are a bit heavier than the polymer ones. I haven't received them yet, but I'm not planning to replace the old ones, even if I receive the new ones, as for the time being my brakes are well bled and everything works perfectly. However, I'm going to let you know once I decide to swap the polymer ones with the new titanium ones that I ordered. At that point, and before I close this video, I have to share with you a new bike hack that I just tried and it will be in the testing phase until the next time I decide to bleed my brakes. So, if you use hydraulic brakes that use dot brake fluid, you may already know that you cannot store large quantities of dot brake fluid for long, as it is hydroscopic and this means that once opened, it absorbs humidity from the air and deteriorates with time. That's why it's often said that you have to get smaller packages of dot brake fluid and also you should try to use as much as possible as soon as possible, even if it means that you bleed multiple bikes at once. For example, I bled both these brakes and the brakes of my street trials bike so as to use as much as possible at once. However, I was always concerned about this issue and the potential environmental damage that could be caused by home mechanics who love to maintain their bikes. So, I was always looking for a viable solution other than persuading all of your friends to bleed their brakes too so as to make use of the fresh fluid. This time I tried to vacuum seal the bottle with the remaining fluid and I actually did that two times to add an extra layer of protection. So, this bike hack will be in the test phase until the next time I need to bleed my brakes. If the bugs are still tightly closed, it would mean that no air or humidity had contaminated the brake fluid and it's still as good as new. If you want to learn about the outcome of this experiment, subscribe to this channel so as to get notified when I decide to bleed my brakes again and I'm sure that in the meantime, I'll share with you many more bike hacks like this one. So that's it for today guys and I hope that you enjoyed this one. However, I'm quite curious if you also read the manuals of your bike parts before you maintain them. Also, I'd like to know if you also keep an archive of manuals so as to get back to them whenever you need to clarify any little detail such as tightening torque specifications or assembly sequences. Moreover, what do you think about the dot fluid preservation bike hack? Will it hold its vacuum seal over time? Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. If you think that the RTFM abbreviation was helpful, you can share this video and help others that may want to tinker with their bikes and they don't know where to start. Thank you so much for subscribing and watching and until next time, have fun riding your bikes and make sure that your bikes are well maintained. Bye!